Let's begin with reading Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. The pericope I'll be unpacking uh, in this talk. In the first six verses, as you know, uh, of chapter 3, Paul has announced what really is the heart, I think, of the epistle. And yes, I'm assuming Paul is the author. Uh, namely, the, the unfolding of this mystery that's been hidden in past ages. And Paul sees himself as uh, not uniquely, but especially called by God to proclaim this mystery in these last days. And there, you know, with that in the background, he says uh, in verse 1 of chapter 4, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves, and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Not without reason, C.H. Dodd uh, has called this epistle the crown of Paulinism, anchored in eternal election, redemption in time by Christ, effectual calling by the Spirit, all of this God's work, God's program, the mystery of the ages is to make out of the two peoples, Jew and Gentile, one new body with Christ as its head. And so this letter weaves together soteriology and ecclesiology, topics in systematic theology that we too easily separate, or, on the other hand, too easily confuse. Characteristic of Paul's letters, uh, the transition from more of a doctrinal focus to more of an exhortation is announced by the therefore of verses 1 through 3. I, therefore, prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, that calling which he has unpacked for us already in chapters 1 and 2, chosen in Christ, redeemed by Christ, called by the Spirit. Notice the Trinitarian uh, theme woven throughout the epistle. Uh, everything comes from the Father, in the Son, by the Spirit. You don't have these external works of the Godhead divided up uh, among the persons of the Trinity, but rather every work of the Trinity is done by the Father, in the Son, through the Spirit. And as Douglas Farrow has pointed out so well, the ascension really is the intersection in Christology, eschatology, and ecclesiology. Yet the ascension is very often overlooked. Uh, even in studying Paul's epistle, uh, it doesn't get as much airtime as election and redemption and a lot of the other doctrines, sanctification, uh, a lot of the other doctrines that uh, are also prominent in the letter. There is one body and one spirit, he says. 
just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. The imperative, therefore, to maintain eagerly, and that's the sense of the verb, maintain against all costs, even against difficult odds, to maintain that bond of unity. The, the basis of that is the objective indicative of that unity that already exists. This is not a unity that we're called to attain because we didn't elect ourselves. We didn't elect the people sitting next to us. Unlike uh, affinity groups and consumer demographics, these are not people we chose to be our brothers and sisters. This isn't who has the same playlist on their iPods. This isn't uh, who likes to get together uh, for picnics. This is a family, a crazy family, that uh, only God could possibly have drawn together into one body. There is one body and one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father. Far from excluding the subjective aspect of personal faith in Christ, this objective character of God's work and activity is the very basis for all of his exhortations that follow. Further, without suggesting a fully developed dogma, it's impossible to miss the Trinitarian structure of Paul's argument throughout the epistle. Uh, especially in chapter 1, God's grace is given to sinners from the Father, in the Son, through the Spirit. That Trinitarian structure is very clear throughout. The point is reiterated in uh, chapter 3, verses 14 through 18. For Paul, the unity of the Godhead and the plurality of the Godhead are mutually interpreting. And I'm not suggesting that Paul has a, a fully developed uh, uh, theology of the Trinity here, but it certainly is presupposed. The doctrine of the Trinity, unity and plurality, is certainly uh, presupposed in all that he says here. Plurality is not accidental, but essential to the uni unique kind of unity that God is. It doesn't compromise the essence, but the kind of God we worship is not just uh, a, a, uh, a unity of essence, but three persons who bear that essence. For the body, he says in 1 Corinthians 12, 14, does not consist of one member, but of many. And so there, as long as we keep it analogical and don't try to draw a one-to-one -one correspondence between the Holy Trinity and uh, the church, there is certainly an analogy here, that I think, that, uh, that Paul draws. Just as the church, uh, just as the Trinity cannot be reduced either to unity or plurality, the church cannot either. And that I see as, as the two tendencies very often in ecclesiology to go in the direction of losing all of the particularity of the, the diverse members of the body. Even the particular, particularity of Jesus, the living head, as Jesus and the members get collapsed into one totus Christus. Or the opposite tendency, to treat the church merely as the sum total of all of the individuals. First, the church is constituted, Paul says, as one body. It's constituted neither hierarchically nor democratically because in both instances, the source would be from the earth. But very definitely, already from chapter 1, Paul has established that this is a reality that comes down out of heaven based in God's decision and God's work, not in our decision or our work. Second, the church comes into existence through one spirit. The one God and Father is over, epi, all, in his sovereign grace, but is also through, dia, all, in the Son, and within, in, all, by the Spirit, in verse 6. Paul's eschatology presupposes this inextricable connection between the Spirit and these last days as in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11, 2 Timothy 3, 1, uh, 
also in, in uh, other epistles, Hebrews 1, 2, James 5, 3, 2 Peter 3, 3. So the pouring out of the Spirit uh, is what marks these last days as these last days. Third, the church is driven by one hope. And it's the indwelling Spirit who propels us toward that hope, who keeps us in that hope. It's precisely the present, uh, presence of the Holy Spirit that not only mediates Christ's presence here and now, but also keeps us longing for his bodily return. And so one of the reasons that we live such difficult, confused, and conflicted lives in tension is precisely because the Spirit indwells us. Fourth, the Apostle teaches that the center of the church's unity is one Lord. Not one bishop, not one charismatic leader, or movement, not one beloved pastor, or shared experiences of friendship, or ethnic and social affinities. It's always easy, and this will come out uh, further as we go along in this passage, it's always easy for the church to look away from its ascended head. Because Christ is gone in the flesh, we shift our hope, our focus, and our faith to earthly represent, rep, representatives, and we can see it very clearly when it's in traditions out there. It's more difficult for us to see how we do it in our own churches and movements. Fifth, the substance of the church's unity is one faith. I think with good reason, theologians have distinguished between the fides qua creditur, the faith which believes, and the fides quae creditur, the faith that is believed. Uh, that fits with the way faith is used throughout the New Testament. Sometimes it is the faith once and for all delivered to the saints. In other cases, the faith that believes, that trusts in Christ. Especially with the definite article, the faith refers to the fides quae creditor, the faith that is believed which is an objective content. And so we, on, on one hand, there is a danger of reducing faith to the fides quae creditor, which is that tendency toward unity without plurality. Well, the church teaches this, assent to it, and participate in the belief act of the church. Uh, or to reduce the act of faith to our subjective believing, uh, without any serious uh, attention given to the objective content of that faith. Elsewhere, Paul reminds Timothy of the importance of sound teaching, even what he calls the pattern of sound words. There is a, there's a proper way of talking about God and human beings and salvation, redemption in Christ. On one hand, Paul consistently teaches that each of us has been given faith to trust in Christ in contrast to the unicity of a church that believes for you collectively. On the other hand, one faith in this context directs us not to each person's act of faith, but to the creed that the Christian community confesses in all times and places. So ecclesiology can't smother soteriology but one's personal relationship with Christ does not dissolve ecclesiology either. That's a difficult tightrope to walk. Six, the church is claimed by God through one baptism. The deepest bond in the body of Christ, once again, is established by God's election and God's redemption and God's claim on us by His Spirit not on the claims that we make toward each other or the natural ties that we have to communities with certain affinities. There is one baptism. Like these other bonds of unity, one baptism ensures that the church's identity comes to, to it from the outside. At no point in any of these clauses is there any mention of something that the church does individually or collectively to establish ecclesial identity. All of these are gifts to the church from outside that anchor it and establish it in the work and will of God. 
There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And so the, the, the tightrope that we have to walk, I think, is between, on one hand, the tendency to collapse the believer's faith into the faith of the church and to separate the believer's faith from the belief of the church. Finding any uh, of these clauses as anything other than uh, lodged in the sovereign purpose and plan of a gracious God uh, will ultimately show itself uh, not only in our soteriology but in our ecclesiology. Uh, I know that this will probably come up in the discussion. I, I, I hope it does because I think it's a very important issue that each of these clauses is objective. It is outside of us. The church does not create its own existence. The church is not the sum total of those who confess Christ. The church is created by the word that evokes by the ministry of the Holy Spirit that confession. The baptism that he's talking about, I believe, is objective fact as well. It, it shows that baptism is, first of all, God's claim on us. Uh, in one uh, commentary, uh, we read that both one faith and the one baptism are purely inward, visible, and individual acts of the believer rather than the external public and corporate word and work of God. And the implications of that flow over into the second half of this chapter, as I'll be bringing out a little bit later. So anticipating his emphasis on the ascension, all of Paul's clauses move from the triune God, the cause, to us, the effect, rather than the other way around. Seventh, the source of the church's existence is also its end, for from him and to him and through him are all things. One God and Father concludes this series of clauses. One God and Father. Rudolf Schnackenberg comments, only with the look up to the one God and Father of all does the enumeration of unity motifs reach its peak. That seems characteristic of the way Paul talks about all things coming from the Father in the Son by the Spirit, as James also highlights in James 1.17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Well, what about the ascension? Now, now we come to the, the part that's really the heart of what I want to talk about, the ascension, distributing the spoils of victory, beginning with verse 8. Therefore it says... That is, Psalm 68 says, When he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. Now, since the Apostle Paul is quoting Psalm 68, it helps to go back to Psalm 68 and do a little bit of spade work to see why he's drawing on this particular psalm. It's one of the ascension psalms, typically included in the, uh, uh, among the ascension psalms. John D. Levinson, uh, Harvard uh, professor of Jewish studies, uh, richly develops the theme of two traditions, the Sinai tradition and the Zion tradition, in his book, Zion and Zion. And he argues that this psalm is central uh, in the, the liturgy of Israel uh, and in its own consciousness of the Psalter because it is not only a psalm of ascent, uh, but it may indeed have been composed to celebrate the entrance of the Ark of the Covenant for the first time into the sanctuary, the permanent dwelling place uh, in the temple. It's a war psalm. It's a war psalm that basically begins with the God of Sinai and ends identifying God with Zion. Because between the Exodus and enjoying the land of Canaan, there lies a vast desert 
to be endured in the wilderness temptation as well as then in the conquest. As important as Sinai is in that march, it's only midway. Sinai is not the destination. Sinai is, is midway between liberation and Sabbath rest. It's a covenant of law prescribing the work to be done rather than the Sabbath rest itself. It's a place of trial rather than a place of victory. Levinson observes that the focus shifts from Sinai to Zion, for example, in Psalm 97, but also in this Psalm, uh, Psalm 68. And in the Zion traditions, he writes, there will, be, there will emerge something almost unthinkable in the case of Sinai, a pledge of divine support for a human dynasty. Thus, the march from Sinai to Zion also speaks of a progress in covenantal history from conditionality and temporality, Levinson says, to unconditional and everlasting blessing based on pure promise. It's really remarkable to you know, read this, this, this uh, great insight that definitely leads to Christ in you know, Galatians 3 and 4, uh, all sorts of passages in Hebrews, uh, especially uh, Hebrews uh, 12, 20 to the end. All these passages start flooding our minds. And Levinson says at the end of the day, this is where Christianity and Judaism divide because for us, Sinai always speaks the loudest. But he sees that in his own words, the heavenly Zion exists by his grace alone, end quote. And that's why Jeremiah 7 faults those who have, in Levinson's words, taken the cosmos out of the cosmic mountain, turning it into a matter of real estate. They do not long enjoy and awe for the mountain. Why should they? They're standing on it. The edifice on Mount Zion does not correspond to the gate of heaven. It is the gate of heaven. In other words, they have lost the sense of the delicacy of relationship between the higher and lower Jerusalem and have assumed that the latter always reflects the former perfectly. Doesn't that sound like Galatians 4? Really remarkable comparisons with Paul's argument about the heavenly and earthly Jerusalem and also a warning to all of our ecclesiologies how easy it is for us to, to, to lose that sense of tension between the already and the not yet, to absolutize uh, uh, to, to, to jump the eschatological gun, as it were, and to see any particular location of God's presence as its consummated form. Recapitulating the trial of Adam and Eve and Israel in the desert, Jesus leads the exiles out of the ultimate bondage into the liberation of the, the Sabbath rest. And so Hebrews interprets uh, this transition from Sinai to Zion in Christological terms, as Levinson also points out. And so with Christ's fulfillment of the work of new creation and conquest, all prior history, including the Sinai theocracy, now belongs to the old order that is passing away, fading, and becoming obsolete. Christ's resurrection has inaugurated the age to come. And so, as Robert Jensen finally puts it, by Jesus' resurrection occurring first, a sort of hole opens in the event of the end, a space for something like what used to be history for the church and its mission. It's this passage, Psalm 68, that Paul appeals to in Ephesians 4.8. Uh, let me quote the context, not the whole psalm, but the context uh, of uh, the, the uh, passage that uh, Paul quotes in verse 20. O mountain of God, mountain of Bashan, O many peaked mountain, mountain of Bashan, why do you look with hatred, O many peaked mountain, at the mount that God desires for his abode? Yes, where the Lord will dwell forever. The chariots of God are twice ten thousand, thousands upon thousands. The Lord is among them. Sinai is now in the sanctuary. 
You ascended on high, leading a host of captives in your train and receiving gifts among men, even among the rebellious, that the Lord God may dwell there. Blessed be the Lord who daily bears us up. God is our salvation. Our God is a God of salvation, and to God, the Lord, belong deliverances from death. Verse 1, God shall arise, his enemies be scattered, and those who hate him shall flee before him, uh, echoes the battle cry in Numbers 10.35. It's a war cry. This is a war psalm. And in that event, in Numbers, the Ark of the Covenant was leading the people of Israel through the wilderness on their way to Zion. And so Psalm 68 is a song that, uh, that is cor uh, correlative to that, that narrative. O oh God, when you went out before your people, verse 7, when you marched through the wilderness, the earth quaked, the heavens poured down rain before God, the one of Sinai, before the God, the God of Israel. We read that the, the mighty men slept while the women gathered the spoils and announced the victory. Okay, let's see. So the fighting men the great men of valor of Israel were asleep. The women were uh, dividing the spoils of the victory. Then who was the victor? It was very clear from the psalm who the victor is. God was doing all the work while Israel slept. Lots of parallels with the book of Joshua there. God just hands over the territory to Israel. They have to work very hard to mess it up. The kings of the armies, they flee, they flee. And then the spoil is divided. So this is the picture that Paul has in mind when he's talking about the ascension of Christ in Ephesians 4. The God of Sinai is now the God of Zion. Now there are a couple of interesting changes that, that the apostle makes, apostolic liberty, uh, to this psalm. The first is... The most obvious that uh, in, in uh, all the reliable uh, versions of Psalm 68, it says that God received gifts from people, even the, the rebellious. However, Paul says here that when he ascended, he gave gifts to people. What accounts for this difference? There, among the commentators, uh, almost as many views as there are uh, commentators. Uh, but I think that Paul's otherwise puzzling uh, editing of the psalm from you received gifts to he gave gifts makes perfect sense in the light of the ascension as the fuller reality of which the ascent of the Ark of the Covenant was merely a type and a shadow. It, it, Christ is the gift giver. Christ has ascended in triumphant procession, not to an earthly Zion, but to its heavenly archetype. He enters not with the Ark of the Covenant and its sacred, sacred tablets, Sinai in miniature, or with the sacrifices it prescribed, but he enters the true tabernacle, the true temple, the true sanctuary of God with his own blood. And furthermore, it is not only the sacrifice to end all sacrifice, but it brings salvation and blessing to all nations, not only Israel, and promises an everlasting rest rather than a temporary land of blessing. So just as ancient rulers divide the spoils of conquest and then erect a temple palace in honor of their victory, Zion's sanctuary is the house that Israel's champion builds to celebrate his victory over all the earth. The captives in the victorious train of the conquerors are Satan, death, and hell. And then thirdly, the gifts that he gave. What are the gifts that he gave? Uh, the presence of each one in verses 7 and 16 form an inclusio. Uh, beginning with unity, the unity of the church, Moving in verses 7 through 10, back to, to, or moving to diversity, and then back to unity in verses 11 through 16. And the first 
basis of this unity, the first thing that Paul mentions as the gift that he gives in the spo as the spoils of his ascension are the gifts of ministers. Now, uh, we have a lot of a lot of us may think that we're God's gifts to the church. Uh, maybe our congregations don't think quite so much of that point. But really, that is the, that, that is the point that Paul is making. Uh, the gifts that he poured out in his ascension are people. Namely, apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastors and teachers, or the pastor teachers, since that clause is the only one with a definite, uh, uh, there is no definite article uh, before teachers, I take it to mean uh, pastor teachers. But the broader gifts highlight the diversity and plurality of the many who serve the common good. You see, Paul has already established the unity of the body of Christ and the equality that all members share in one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Ministers do not share in a greater measure of the grace but there is a diversity of graces given to the body. And again, in ecclesiology, we have tendency either to, to, to emphasize the, 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 the unity of the body that everyone shares and go in an egalitarian direction of ministry or a democratic view of ministry, or a tendency, on the other hand, uh, to so emphasize the specific gifts that he mentions here that we establish a more hierarchical view of church and ministry. Paul has underscored that Christ is the giver of these gifts, verses 7 and 8. And he does again this time, now adding autos for emphasis. And he himself gave the apostles. We mustn't miss that. He himself gave the apostles, the evangelists, and pastor teachers. This parallels Psalm 68, where the Lord gains his victory, even as the warriors slept, just to underscore that this is a kingdom we are receiving, not a kingdom that we are building. It is Christ who is raised and ascended, assuring us that we too will share fully in his heavenly triumph, not by imitating his ascension, but by sharing in it by being beneficiaries of it. And all of the gifts named are ministers of the word. All of the apostles were evangelists, but not all evangelists were apostles. And each of these offices in Ephesians 4.11 is distinguished by a definite article, but as I mentioned, uh, there is one definite article for the pastors and teachers, suggesting that that is one office. The goal of the gifts is growth together in Christ. The rest of this section, verses 12 through 14, uh, provokes a lot more exegetical debate. So everything's been smooth water until now. And uh, now this is the part where my grandma always said, you stop preaching and go to Medlin. Uh, and I'm, just, I'm, I'm throwing, making an argument here that I know a lot of folks uh, have very good reason to dispute. So I'm perfectly happy to... To, uh, to hear your pushback on this. But the rest of the section focuses especially on how these gifts that he gave benefit the body of Christ. Essentially, it comes down to the question as to whether these ministers are given for the completion of the saints, as the King James Version and other older translations render it, or whether they are given for the purpose of equipping the saints to be ministers, or equipping the saints for the work of the ministry, as the ESV and other translations have it. Uh, I didn't show my hand by, uh, by uh, uh, rendering my own translation uh, here, but it will become obvious that I don't agree with the translation I just read. According to the older translation, it's the aforementioned officers who are given for A, the completion or building up of the body of Christ, the perfection of the saints, B, the work of ministry, and C, the edification of Christ's body. So the purpose clauses correspond 
to the offices that Paul has just mentioned as the gifts that he gave. In terms of syntax, the question comes down to the best translation of the verb catartismos, uh, which can go either way. Uh, catartismos and the preposition ice. So how you, uh, there, there are perfectly good uh, arguments syntactically uh, uh, for either case. But in terms of usage, in terms of usage at least, catartizane usually means to, to set a bone or to, or to build a house, to refit a ship, to take something that is broken and fix it and put it back together again. And it's used in similar ways in the New Testament as in Matthew 4.21, Mark 1.19, Hebrews 10.5, and 11.3. So, uh, in my view, older translations seem preferable. Christ gave ministers for the purpose of completing the saints as God's building and for the edification of the whole body of Christ. And that fits better, I think, with the results that Paul elaborates in verses 13 through 15, where the saints are, by this ministry, built up in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature adulthood, no longer children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, but instead are speaking the truth in love so that they grow up in every way into him who is the head, even Christ. So you see, these offices are given for these purposes, and they have these effects. And in each case, the purposes and the effects point to the offices that he has mentioned at the beginning. A church that doesn't have hospitality is not a very good church. A church that doesn't have charity, that isn't a giving church, doesn't give joyfully and cheerfully, has some problems that need to be solved. A church that doesn't have the proper preaching of the word and administration of the sacraments isn't a church. And that's why he mentions here what, what is expanded upon elsewhere. In 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans 12, you can find a list of spiritual gifts that, that not just ministers have. And you need all of those gifts for a thriving body. But if the Word really does create the church, then it is out of that true, pure preaching of that Word in the power of the Holy Spirit that everything else will be set together in its proper place. Doesn't mean that there's nothing else to be done in the church than preach the word and administer the sacraments, but it is to say that out of this ministry of Christ, it is Christ's own ongoing ministry in the world. Through this ministry of Christ himself, the church will come into being in the first place. And the members will grow up into one body, not being blown around back and forth with every wind of doctrine. Rudolf Schnackenberg supports this reading when he says, The aforementioned ministers are gifts that Christ gave for the preparation of the saints, for a work of service, and for the building up of the body of Christ. Uh, in, in Paul elsewhere, catartismos has more the sense of making perfect, uh, uh, making perfect in faith, for example, in 1 Thessalonians 3.10, uh, being made perfect or complete in a common conviction, 1 Corinthians 1.10, or in everything good, the writer to the Hebrews has it in Hebrews 13.21. And so I think it's a bit of a stretch for us to think, it can be done, but it's a bit of a stretch, I think, especially in the context of his argument, to translate this for the equipping of the saints. It should be for the perfecting of the saints by the work of ministry. But the application is clear. Uh, this interpretation, which has become really predominant now, uh, is the sedis doctrinae for every member ministry. And the, the tendency, at least, of this interpretation is to 
eradicate every vestige of a distinction between sheep and shepherds, between ministers and those who receive their ministry. In fact, a lot of the commentators take the opposite view of the syntactical argument in explicit defense of the abolition of a distinction between clergy and laity. So it's hardly a, a dis, dispassioned uh, uh, e evaluation on either side of the debate. The apostle elsewhere draws a very clear distinction between the general office that all believers share, prophets, priests, and kings, and the special office of pastors, elders, and deacons. And so he can even say in 1 Timothy 5.17, let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. Paul pleaded with the Ephesian elders, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. As Jesus' teaching makes perfectly clear, these are not to be lords in the Gentile sense, lording it over the people, but servants. Uh, nevertheless, they are told to submit. The people are told to submit to their leaders uh, because this is to their benefit. We've got to recover. It's hard in America to do this. We've got to recover the idea that authority isn't always abused. That, that authority can be the means of enriching our lives. And that's the argument I think Paul is very clearly laying out here, that th this is a gift of Christ's ascension, that his church is made a recipient of his work through the ministry of sinful ministers. What a remarkable thing. What an amazing thing that he's doing. As Andrew Lincoln reminds us, an active role for all believers is safeguarded in verses 7 and 16. Each part of the body functioning properly. But he says the primary context here in verse 12 is the function and role of Christ's specific gifts, the ministers, not that of all the saints. Rendering catartism on completion has a straightforward meaning which does not require supplementing by a further phrase. And diakonia service is more likely to refer to the ministry of the ministers just named. It's hard to avoid the suspicion that opting for the other view is too often motivated by a zeal to avoid clericalism and to support a democratic model of the church. Finally, the theological and practical implications uh, of all of this. It seems to me that, that contemporary ecclesiologies are often ranged between these two extremes of a democratic view of the church and a hierarchical view of a church. Two extremes that generate exaggerated reactions. And what we need to do is return our focus to the ascension, which reorients our map, if you will, of ministry in these last days. On one hand, there's a tendency to collapse the many into the one, the sign into the reality, the visible into the invisible, the not yet into the already, and the head into the members. And I won't mention which tradition I think does that most obviously. But it does fit with the doctrine of transubstantiation, where the earthly signs become annihilated and simply are transformed into the reality itself. The visible church simply is Jesus' presence among us. It is the kingdom of God, maybe going from acorn to oak tree, but it is uh, uh, a consummated reality that is, being, uh, that is unfolding in each successive age. And so I do think that the, the, the question of the ascension is directly tied to what we're taught, well, it's obviously tied in Paul's thinking. But why? Why is it so important? Why is it so essential? I think part of it is because there is a tendency always for us to look away from Christ and to immanentize our ecclesiology, either, either by locating, identifying the unity of the church with a single head, 
or identifying, with, uh, identifying it with the, the works and activity and willing and running of its individual members. And what Paul has done here uh, is, to, is to say, look back to Christ, seated at the Father's right hand, absent in the flesh, returning one day in the flesh, but in this interim, he has sent his Holy Spirit, pouring out his, his Spirit uh, on all flesh through the ministry of preaching and sacrament. And that's why it's so important to him that, he's, that, that he point out right at the outset in this passage, unlike other passages, these specific gifts that he gave for that very purpose. Paul's body of Christ analogy is not to be taken uh, in the sense of replacing Christ, nor merely as a figure of speech. Uh, we are not one Christ, but one with Christ. As Leslie Newbigin observes, taken univocally, the theory of the church as the extension of the incarnation springs from a confusion of Sarks with Soma, Christ's risen body, that is, his ecclesial, distinguished from his natural body, is not fleshly, but spiritual. He did not come to incorporate us into his body according to the flesh, but into his body according to the spirit. So we have to beware of, of, of seeing the, the physical Jesus evaporate so that we're no longer longing for his coming. We don't may not even want him to return. It might actually get in our way if Jesus comes back bodily. We have so replaced him, either as a unified church or a collective, active uh, movement of its members. Increasingly, the particular person, Jesus of Nazareth, has been forgotten, and nature abhors a vacuum. Literally, in the Middle Ages, the church could control the parousia, by the ringing of a bell. And we sometimes think we can control the parousia by the works that we do, by the collective action. If we just work hard enough, we get together and have a big enough movement, have, get enough people to sign this petition or to get involved in that, that uh, great effort, the kingdom will come. In, in our own day, the synthesis is pursued to its fullest extent by writers like Graham Ward, who scolds those who grieve over and long for what he calls a lost body, the body of the gendered Jew. Instead of realizing that in his ascension, Christ's body is not lost, but infinitely extended. His natural body becomes transcorporeal, Ward says. He returns, in fact already has returned, in and as the church. Brian McLaren makes the same move in one of his recent books. It's a dangerous tendency that we've seen in the medieval church, and now we're seeing increasingly in Protestant circles as well. At the other extreme, often in reaction against this first paradigm, is the tendency to separate the invisible, eternal, and spiritual reality from everything visible, temporal, and creaturely. We saw that in the interpretation of some of what baptism means in Ephesians 4. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Uh, is this referring to uh, a, a baptism that doesn't have anything to do with the mediation of the church, the, medi the mediation of the ministers? It's not a physical baptism, it's an invisible bap baptism. And this approach of separating things that God has joined together without confusing them necessarily leads to a democratic reaction against special offices as sacramentalist and hierarchical and so forth. But I think as a result, the logic of Paul's argument, namely that Christ is delivering the spoils of his victory, is easily exchanged for a model of a church that focuses on the activity of believers. Are we ever a church of receivers before we are a church of actors? And then one faith can eventually succumb to the subjective act of a lot of people believing. And the, the act of faith becomes what's really important. 
not the one faith that the whole church shares together. Pharaoh suggests that we have a tendency to look away from Christ in large measure because we don't know what to do with the ascension. And I think, he's, I think he is right on that point. He suggests that Calvin, like Irenaeus, brought attention back to the economy and thus to the problem of Christ's absence, especially in the Eucharistic debates. But why, asked Calvin, do we repeat the word ascension so often? And, you know, the cynical uh, historian might say, well, because uh, you're, kind of, you're, you're constantly using it as a club against the Lutherans. Not, not so. Uh, Calvin says that it's so important to emphasize the ascension because if you don't have, first of all, because the New Testament does, but also because if you don't have Christ truly absent in the flesh, Until the end of time, what are you looking forward to at the end of history? And if, if his ascended body isn't like the ascended bo the, the glorified body that we will have, what is the eschatological connection between Christ and his members? And so it would be easy to say Christ is not, ab not present until he returns in glory at the end of the age, so we're just waiting. Or it would be easy to say that he returns in and as the church, the really difficult position, but the one that Calvin ends up arguing is that the Holy Spirit mediates Christ's presence here and now so that Christ is truly present. The Spirit hasn't replaced Jesus, but the Spirit unites us to Christ so that we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. Whether conceived in hierarchical and clerical or democratic and lay-oriented terms, both extremes that I've mentioned tend to downplay the identity of the church as a community of receivers. What is Jesus doing in this in-between time as he is ascended, sitting at the Father's right hand? Not just waiting to return at the end of the age, though that will be a wonderful uh, day. In the meantime, he is pouring out these gifts. He is dispensing these gifts. Well, where is the kingdom? I don't see it. The promise here is that he's dispensing the spoils. We have a uh, uh, tradition in uh, Southern California, started in the Mexican-American community, but uh, uh, practiced uh, more, more broadly in our families on birthdays of a pinata and, uh, for, for the birthday party. And uh, boy, you ought to see those little kids go when, when uh, one of the especially uh, energetic and enthusiastic kids pokes that hole in the pinata and the candy goes everywhere. That's what I think of. That's the picture I think of when I read Ephesians 4. That's what Jesus has done by his ascension. He tore a hole through the middle of history so that all the candy could fall through. The Holy Spirit descends through that hole and distributes all the gifts. And the gifts that he gave are, first of all, the ministry of his word and sacraments and the care of the flock of Christ. Well, then where do, what about good works? Is there no place for good works? That's the question. What do we do? This is all about what he does for us. What about what we do? That's what we need, a church that's more active, that's more get or done. Uh, well, there is no church if there is no gospel. Just a bunch of active people. The good news is that Christ gives us these gifts so that, first and foremost, we can have the forgiveness of sins and be united with Christ, be made new creatures in him, and then as a result, as new creatures, live and move and have our being in the world as a colony of Christ. And that does make every difference in the world. Because God does want to love and serve our neighbors through us. But even there, our good works are not going up to God, but out to our neighbors who need us. Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights. Or as Paul said uh, 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 in uh, Romans 11, for who's given him anything? 
all that we give him, all that we surrender for Jesus, who's given him anything that he should repay him? For from him and to him and through him are all things, to whom be the glory forever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the mar marvelous gift of your son and that we are recipients not only of his death and resurrection, but also of his ascension, and not only of his benefits, but of Christ himself, united to him. We thank you, Father, that we are not our own, but belong to him, which means we belong to each other, that lodged in your electing, redeeming, regenerating grace, we have been made a, a family that we would never have picked for ourselves that you have adopted us into that family, you've made us new creatures, and that even now Christ is praying at your right hand that our faith will not fail, that we will endure all temptation. Help us not to look away from him, even though he is absent from us in the flesh. May we cling to him by your word and spirit, for we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Horton, very much. Thanks. Actually, you're not off the hot seat. You're right on the hot okay. seat. Uh, we're going to uh, proceed to questions and answers, and uh, it was a, a very uh, stimulating, provocative lecture, and I'm sure that there are going to be a number of questions that will be raised. Um, a very uh, good treatment biblically, theologically. There are going to be some questions. Let me begin with a practical one. Um, my guess is most here probably would be on the one end of more democratic. Um, if, in fact, you were to, they were to ask you, uh, Dr. Horton, how would you suggest I go about this? I'm, I'm pastoring a church right now, and, and, and we do lean in that way. We do understand Ephesians 4 in that way. What would your counsel be to that person, that pastor, with his, with his leaders? Not necessarily that they're going to move in a... Um, um, the, the complete, of course, Roman Catholic hierarchical, but no. what counsel would you give practically and pastorally? To, to, to people who take a different interpretation of the, the passage, but... Uh, well, that would lean too much in the democratic okay. sort of way. In other words, the priesthood of the believer and leaving yeah. it at that, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Greg. I think that... Uh, one helpful distinction here is between the general office and the special office. To, uh, we, we dare not take away the wonderful uh, recovery of the priesthood of all believers. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, that is, uh, any believer can go directly to God through Jesus Christ, uh, our only mediator. Uh, uh, it's, it's baptism not ordination that makes a Christian. Mm -hmm. That's the basic uh, principle of, of the priest of all believers. But that has come to mean the ministryhood of all believers, mm -hmm. that, that uh, all sheep are shepherds. And that certainly is a conclusion that none of the reformers would have drawn from the priest of all believers, and I don't think can be drawn from the New Testament with so many explicit passages on how to ordain, <laughs> uh, qualifications for, uh, for these offices, what these offices are, uh, how, how uh, the body is built up by mutually submitting to the officers. And by the way, the officers mutually submitting to each other. Mm -hmm. uh, in every church, leaders will rule, make no mistake about it. The, the question is, who's, to whom are the leaders accountable? And... Uh, that, that is where I think that, that, ironically, a very egalitarian, democratic, uh, kind of movement-oriented ecclesiology easily, easily is corrupted before long in the direction, ironically, of tyranny. Mm -hmm. uh, and any, any form of government can be corrupted mm -hmm. uh, very easily because we're the ones doing it. Yeah. Uh, the ones exercising it, but it's a. I, I think that that 
an important question is how, how are those exhortations in the New Testament to be taken seriously if all of us are, uh, uh, because we hold a special, a uh, general office, all of us are also uh, thinking of ourselves as uh, officers in the special office mm -hmm. sense. Yeah, thank you. One follow-up. Do you, is your sense, Michael, that some of those have been uh, frustrated with with the sort of uh, what you've laid out, the priesthood of the believer, and yet even offices, where, where they've moved more in a either a Canterbury direction or a Roman direction. Is that, you think, some of that? Is there some relation there, do you think? I think there might be a, a relationship there. Uh, others could, could uh, answer that better than I could. I, I think that uh, uh, there is, I, I think a lot of it really is our American culture. I think we're very, we're very good at seeing the problem with Christendom, for example, mm -hmm. because we're, you know, it doesn't exist anymore. Uh, there are people who would like for it to still exist, but in matter of fact, uh, it, it uh, doesn't. So I think that uh, it's easier for us to look back and say, whether it's the medieval church or the, or the Reformation church, uh, they made a lot of mistakes. Uh, uh, the, the Reformation didn't uh, do anything for the separation of church and state. And, you know, uh, it uh, uh, still believed very much that the that the prince or the city council was uh, in charge of enforcing the uh, creed of the of the church. So. We can look back and say that was that was terrible. That was a terrible corruption. I think it's harder for us to see the ways in which we are shaped yeah. by our own cultural distinctives. We just think that democracy and God kind of go together, mm -hmm. and uh, I think there, it, it's worth kind of searching out what uh, the yeah what a representative government. A kind of constitution. What we have in, in the New Testament, I think, is a constitutional monarchy. It, it's, you know, the scripture is the constitution. But Christ is ruling through uh, the uh, offices that he has set up by, by his constitution. All right, thank you. Other questions, please? Yes, please come to the microphone. Kind of short, so... <laughs> um, uh, Dr. Harden, thank you so much for um, your teaching. Um, I really appreciated the um, emphasis on um, the church being created by the word, receiving the kingdom from God, and um, the important distinction you made between the spiritual body of the church and the physical body, which we long for in, uh, in the uh, second coming. Um, I have um, a question about... Um, the place of good works in ecclesiology, and um, it's it's really based on uh, verse 16, um, 15 and 16. It says, uh, "Rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in Him, uh, grow up in every way into Him who is ahead into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow, so that it builds itself up in love." So um, I, I totally agree with you that um, there are certain officers, um, you mentioned pastors and teachers especially, who have authority in the church and um, whose role is to um, help the rest of the church to mature. Um, but at the same time as we um, always acknowledge that we're receiving the kingdom, it seems to me that um, good works not only um, by the officers, but by every um, joint, right? Every joint, so every member of the church are necessary for the building up of the church itself and the individual members. Um, and here's another kind of related question. Um, I, I would agree that not everyone in the church is appointed to a specific office of authority, but um, if we look at Romans 12, I would say that there's more than just a general calling of all the saints to be a priesthood of believers, but each individual saint is given a gift or gifts 
with which to minister and do good works to the church. Thank you. Yeah, um, it's, it's difficult to do justice to that side of it. That's the other side of the coin. Uh, to that side of it, uh, when the, the, the focus of my paper, and I think the focus of that passage, is on these specific gifts. We could go to 1 Corinthians 10 or, or Romans, uh, or 1 Corinthians 12 or Romans 12, and go through the lists there, which are far more expansive, uh, and show what it means for every part of the body to do its work. It's given gifts for that, for that purpose. But the reason I think that Paul focuses on these offices here is because he's especially focusing on that work of Christ that creates the church and sustains the church in the first place. Not that, uh, that animates the church in good works uh, uh, or, or exhibits uh, good works, but that animates the church in good works. That you know, the, the gospel is what bears fruit in good works. And so here he's really going to the heart of it. What creates the church? It's not good works. Nothing we do creates the church. Uh, Christ plants church churches. Christ creates church. We uh, are ministers. And so that's the emphasis here. Now, he goes on in the next pericope to talk about not walking as Gentiles uh, the, with their ignorance and their vanity, uh, but clinging to Christ and his body. That's what happens when people are, are well taught. And it's not just an intellectual thing. It's also, it also happens in, in worship. It happens in you know, the fellowship, the prayers, uh, as well as the apostles' teaching. Uh, that is the effect of, of this ministry, of the Spirit through, through his ministers. So I, I think that he's, he's ba basically here he, in this particular passage, not that he doesn't do it elsewhere, in this particular passage, he's focusing on the question, what creates the church in the first place? And not just once, but every day that it exists. What is its source? Christ's ascended mediation at the Father's right hand, dispensing the Holy Spirit through the means of grace. Not means of our commitment, means of our agenda, even the agenda he gives us, doesn't create the church. It charts the church's activity. Is that? Thank you. Yes. Um. Hello? Oh, sorry. Hey, oh, one of the things that has always intrigued me about Ephesians is how little eschatology in some ways plays in the Paul's argument. How many talks about this, I suppose, the Thessalonians, Romans. You know, it's just, it's almost, it's a present reality. And many times in your lecture, you mentioned Pharaohs, who has his two history. You talked about the already, not yet, or God, you use the phrase, he, the two kind of histories came in. And I wonder, is that an inauthentic way and, you know, that kind of formed the undergird, that eschatology formed kind of the basis for your ecclesiology. Is that an inauthentic way to appropriate Paul? Because so much more realized, it wouldn't be better to say Christ bridged heaven and earth instead of two histories. And the reason I ask is you also mentioned so many times a subject object that the faith becomes just subjective. I'm concerned if we have too much of a just wait to history it comes, that then much like evangelicalism, we put our ontology into the end times left behind. And so faith again becomes just a subjective experience. And so, yeah, we can say the ascension is here. It's already come. But when you have such an eschatological reading of Paul and Ephesians, your ecclesiology really breaks down. And so I was curious how you would address that or how you think about is, you know, the ascension is an eschatological reality like a Pondenberg, or how is it really real in a way that holds both the objective and subjective components in a way that are to kind of ground our, college, our ecclesiology in a way authentic to Paul? Thank you for such a, a simple question, uh, <laughs> raising such a simple issue. Um, wow, there's so much there. Uh, you could... Uh, I'm, feel free to, to uh, interact on this um, if you don't like my answer. Uh, I, I, one of the things that I think is kind of exciting about the uh, uh, epistle is 
that it is so realized. The eschatology is so realized here. And elsewhere, Paul is, is so conscious of the already and the not yet tension. I think one of the reasons is because he wants to say, in this aspect, the reality is here. You, you know, what a wonderful realization that I as a Jew especially revel in that God's promises uh, 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 to the patriarchs have been fulfilled, that the worldwide family of God is something that I'm an apostle of now. <laughs> I'm now proclaiming that to the world. I get to go out and I, I get to proclaim that that reality is now. That's not just in the future. Um, the, 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 the fusion of two bodies, Jew and Gentile, into one new person with Christ as its head, that has happened. And so the, some of the kingdom realities are here in a, in a uh, realized way, justification, the new birth, and so forth. Others, uh, we're still awaiting sanctification. I think it all depends on what Paul's emphasizing at that moment. But here, uh, it is realized. It is inaugurated. That real reality is really present, and that's why I think there's such a heavy emphasis on its, it, it wasn't always here, but now it is. Which, of course, makes... I, 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 if, uh, I'm happy to be corrected on this, but I think it's one of the reasons why it seems to me at least Ephesians is the favorite epistle in the Pauline corpus for in the history of Roman Catholic interpretation. Whereas for Protestants, it's usually Romans or Galatians. And I think one of the reasons there is because it is such a realized ecclesiology. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for your lecture, it was very helpful. Um, I guess I, I could use some help and would be interested in your feedback of how you might apply ascension to a slightly different ecclesiological question and tension, but one that I think people in this room would be very sort of struggling with, and that's the relationship between the church as a gathered institution and really kind of the verse 16 of chapter 4 talking about growing up into him who is the head. This idea that the ministry of the church is actually um, not reducible simply to always in the act of mission of drawing in, but also lifting up, right? So us being fully um, formed as Christians in Christ, growing into the head. Mm -hmm. But basically the question has to do with the relationship between the church going up in ascension and the church going out in mission. And if to just juxtapose, juxtapose this text, with another ascension text, which would be uh, Acts 1. Jesus rises, he gives a great commission, go out into the you know, world, preach the gospel, and the last thing the disciples see is the bottoms of Jesus' feet, right? Ascending into heaven. And so in Acts, as I understand it, it this ascension into heaven you know, gives the church the right, in a sense, the, that he is the Lord of all, go to the whole world. So there's a way that ascension even frames mission. And so I guess, how, how might you bring ascension as, as, as an important doctrine to recover to this question of this tension and even in churches of between um, mission and being the church, right? Because, I mean, you, you kind of feel that rub. Sometimes you feel like, you, you know, I'm a church planner, so <laughs> I'm always confronted with decisions about ecclesiology and mission and how to be more effective in mission. So I, I wonder if you might have some thoughts on that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh... Yeah, I, I wrestle with that more in uh, the great, uh, uh, the uh, Gospel Commission, um, a book on the Great Commission, and uh, because it is something that I think we're all uh, kind of st struggling to unravel right now, and uh, there is such a strong, and I think it does come from this radically uh, American impulse. Uh, there is a tendency to uh, just kind of eradicate the church, the visible church altogether. Uh, uh, you see it in titles of, of uh, 
books written by prominent writers that the church is over, uh, or the, uh, not, the, not the church as individual believers, but the church as a visible institution. That's had its day. You can get most of your spiritual resources online, which tells you what people think the church is <laughs> to begin with. Uh, and so mission, I think, becomes unhinged from the church. When I think in the New Testament, the mission of the church is to plant churches. You say, well, the mission is to bring the gospel to... The, well, yeah, they're... they're uh, by proclaiming the gospel and baptizing them, they are added to the number of those who are, uh, uh, belong to Christ. So that you really can't separate getting saved from joining the church. And I think that we've grown up with that for so long at the uh, you know, uh, end of evangelistic appeals. I'm not asking you to join a church, uh, but to ask Jesus into your heart that uh, it really is uh, in a garden alone while the dew is still on the roses. Uh, and the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. And uh, I think that's one of the reasons why people are attracted to Rome and Eastern Orthodoxy, because uh, that privatized individualistic approach to the faith has become so extreme, I think, in North America. But I think we, we've got to have some really good, serious, long conversations about what the mission of the church is. We take a lot of things for granted about being missional, what it means to be missional. But whenever those assumptions are in antithesis to the church, we don't understand, I believe, what missional really is. The promise is for you and for your children and all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God calls to himself. The Great Commission is to bring them in, to care for them, to send them out during the week into their vocations, and to love and serve their neighbors, and to be witnesses to their neighbors, and then start all over again. It's constantly uh, looking after the, the sheep, caring for the sheep. That is the Great Commission. That is our mission. So, uh, yeah, I mean, there's so, so much more, more can be said there. Um, but yeah, I think the Ascension is a great place for us to extrapolate a whole lot of other issues, like pneumatology. I think that you get a stronger pneumatology when you start with the fact of the Ascension. You just can't, you can't uh, deny this problem. <laughs> Jesus is gone in the flesh, and he said he will return in the flesh in exactly the same way that he left. Um, what's happening in, in the middle then? And, and that's where if you don't have a strong pneumatology, you just end up saying, well, he just gave us a bunch of doctrines and instructions. And I guess we just read that for a while until he comes back. Instead of seeing the Holy Spirit as the one who's making it all. Really doing what Jesus doesn't do because he's a different person of the Trinity. He's the mediator. The Holy Spirit has unique personal attributes that only he can, can exhibit. Certain things only the Holy Spirit can do in league with the Father and the Son. Any other questions? Yes. We've got a few minutes left, so do you want to as well? Hi, Dr. Horton. Yeah, I appreciate uh, the talk, and I guess I just had a question uh, related about how do you, how do we affirm the authority of ministers uh, in the church? Uh, well, while they're not, well, guardian against kind of a know your place mentality, I guess, with people in the church where they feel that their ability to step up, take a step of faith and help in leadership development is stifled because, well, there's so much deferential treatment to, well, the staff take care of this. This is their, their role, and, and I don't really feel competent. Yeah. How, how, how do we deal with that contention? Wow. Oh, very difficult. I think it's difficult to, no matter what ecclesiology you have because we have a propensity to uh, say, basically, you know, I, I, do, I don't 
I'm not a plumber. I've got a great plumber. Uh, I, I uh, don't uh, repair my uh, foundation. I call in a, a, a good construction worker. I don't do my taxes. I, I farm that out. And I'm not really a good Christian, <laughs> but I pay my pastor to be. Uh, and I pay the missionaries and the pastors to be Christians for me. There, there really can be that uh, warped view of the Christian life, no matter what your ecclesiology is. And I do think that especially uh, those ecclesiologies that emphasize the role of, of special offices have to be on guard against that. But not just those churches, because one of the things that really does trouble me about uh, what I see happening uh, in, 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 across the board in a lot of our churches is we've gone from ordained special offices where you have people who are not necessarily great uh, personalities, but faithful shepherds and preachers to a business model uh, where uh, you have CEOs you want to talk hierarchy with a vengeance. You know, I've, I have seen it in a lot of cases where people talk about the Moses model of ministry. And I just, oh no, the Moses, wrong part of the Bible. Uh, um, uh, got the law for Moses, grace and truth uh, came through Jesus Christ. Uh, you've heard it said, but I say, you know, there's sort of a regime change in the New Testament. Um, it's not the Moses model of ministry, and even Moses cried that God would give him help, and the answer was elders. So uh, uh, he said a greater prophet would come, and that prophet was Jesus. So I, I do think that we have to be very careful. Touch the Lord, not the Lord's anointed, and so forth. All those things come out when a minister is threatened. Uh, I, I am the one the Lord has appointed spiritually. Well, there's something reassuring about a minister being appointed visibly by Christ through uh, lawfully uh, uh, installed elders. Pastors themselves don't uh, run the show. In fact, one of the, I think, geniuses of the New Testament ecclesiology, as I see it anyway, is that elders run the church. And ministers preach and teach, and they do they do so at the pleasure of of the elders. And the elders, not individually, but only the elders as a body, can make decisions. And then that that group of elders can be disciplined by another group of elders. You know, there's there are checks and balances here, uh, regardless of which view of church polity you take. I do think that we have to to seriously. Uh, evaluate how much hierarchy we're getting these days from a, a purely egalitarian uh, view of ministry. There's a lot of it out there, and there's a lot of pastoral abuse in the name of anti-clericalism. Thank you. Did you have a question? Any others? Last, last opportunity. A uh, last one, and this is a second one for you. Last one. This is a missional question, church planning question. This is very important. Oh. Okay. So you rely a lot on Douglas Farrell's work. And I'm just wondering if you'd respond to book one and book two. And so um, Douglas Farrell wrote a book called Ascension Ecclesia when he was a reformed Anglican. He has since become Roman Catholic, and he's written another book called Ascension Theology, where he Why comes out wrong. swinging as a Catholic apologist. And in that book, he makes very strong claims about... Uh, the nature and the necessity of real presence, i.e. transubstantiation, in order to have um, what he would argue in his Christology, the real humanity of Christ present. And it seems to push against some of the things, but I, I'm just wondering if you've had a chance to process that, because I know that work has been very important in the way you framed ascension, um, and even the way you've presented it to us um, here. Yeah. Thank you, I was hoping to keep that a secret. Uh, yeah. Uh, he, he, the, in the second book, he's, it's, it's basically why my first book was wrong. Uh, 
But uh, I think he was right the first time. Um, I haven't had a chance to read all of it. I have started it, but I haven't finished it. Uh, Ascension and Ecclesia, I think, is, is uh, so insightful. And I hope that uh, T.N.T. Clark keeps publishing it, even though he has sort of uh, taken a different, a different turn. But you, you can see, I mean, just very, very quickly, uh, in his earlier book, you know, he was very, he saw Calvin and Irenaeus as two peas in a pod, and they're the heroes of the story, while, while Origen and the Origenist trajectory leading to Schleiermacher uh, is uh, the villain. The, one, of the, one of the reasons that I think he's right about uh, the, the emphasis of, of Calvin uh, being like that of Irenaeus is because uh, Luther had, to, uh, uh, in, in Luther's view, Christ had to be present bodily at the altar. In Zwingli's view, he didn't have to be present bodily anywhere on earth. He wasn't really present at all. <laughs> uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to us, the community is transubstantiated uh, more than Christ. Uh, body and blood uh, being transubstantiated, uh, the bread and wine being transubstantiated into his body and blood. Calvin, however, says, why is everybody talking about what can or can't happen on an earth, at an earthly altar. The question uh, is, is not how Christ can somehow make his body present on earth before he returns. The question is how can we, being quote unquote separated by such a great distance, can be united to each other by the work of the Holy Spirit? And that's again why he turned to that pneumatological solution. It's not a spiritual presence, it is a real presence, the real pet presence of Christ in his body and blood, according to both natures, not just him spiritually, but by the power of the Spirit, Christ being truly and holy and completely present. Not by coming to earth, but by the Holy Spirit uniting us to Christ in heavenly places. And that, uh, I think when, when you... When you uh, when you change your view on that, uh, and transubstantiation becomes the sort of watershed issue, you get everything else in the bargain. And that's, I, I, uh, th my understanding at least so far is that that is um, what Doug Farrell thinks too, that transubstantiation really is the clincher there. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Let's thank uh, Dr. Horton again. Thanks.